Namaskar. We are now into the eighth year of uh, our monetary policy making under the new inflation targeting uh, framework. If you remember, this was started in October of 2016. So seven years are complete. We are into the eighth year. And uh, on a personal note, if I can seek your indulgence, this would be my 32nd monetary policy, including the off-cycle meeting last year and a special meeting. And at the outset, let me also wish each one of you a very happy new year in advance. And uh, this is how the statement reads. As 2023 comes to an end and a new year begins, the long-awaited normality still eludes global economy. The years 2020 to 2023 will perhaps go down in history as the period of great volatility, comprising a host of black swan events in quick succession. The global economy is showing signs of slowdown, though unevenly across geographies and sectors. The emerging market economies, that is EMEs, as a group have remained resilient during the current bout of volatility, unlike previous episodes. While headline inflation has receded from the highs of last year, it remains above target in many countries. Core inflation continues to be sticky, impeding the last mile of disinflation. Major central banks have kept rates on hold while refraining from forward guidance in view of the prevailing uncertainties. Financial markets remain volatile in their quest for definitive signals about the future path of interest rates. Against this unsettled global environment, the Indian economy presents a picture of resilience and momentum. The real gross domestic product, that is GDP growth for Q2 of the current financial year, has exceeded all forecasts. The fundamentals of the Indian economy remain strong, with banks and corporates showing healthier balance sheets, fiscal consolidation on course, external balance remaining eminently manageable, the forex reserves providing cushion against external shocks. These factors, combined with consumer and business optimism, create congenial conditions for sustained growth of the Indian economy. Looking ahead, it is our endeavor to further build on these fundamentals, which are the best buffer against global supply shocks in today's uncertain world. Let me now turn to the decisions and the deliberations of the Monetary Policy Committee which was held, as you know, on 6th, 7th, and today 8th of uh, December. After a detailed assessment of the evolving macroeconomic and financial developments and the outlook, of course, it, the Monetary Policy Committee decided unanimously to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. Consequently, the standing deposit facility rate remains at 6.25%, and the marginal standing facility, that is MSF rate and the bank rate, at 6.75%. The MPC also decided by a majority of five out of six members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation progressively aligns to the target while supporting growth. I shall now briefly set out the rationale for these decisions. Since the last policy, CPI headline inflation moderated to 4.9% in October from 7.4% in July. The moderation was observed in all components of CPI, namely food, fuel, and core, that is CPI excluding food and fuel. There has been broad-based easing in core inflation, which is indicative of successful disinflation through monetary policy actions. The near-term outlook, however, is masked by risks to food inflation, which might lead to an inflation uptick in November and possibly in December. This needs to be watched for second round effects, if any. Domestic economic activity is holding up well 
as assessed in the previous MPC meetings and as reflected in the GDP growth for the second quarter of this year. Against this backdrop, the MPC decided to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%, but remain highly alert and prepared to undertake appropriate policy actions as warranted. Monetary policy must continue to be actively disinflationary to ensure fuller transmission and anchoring of inflation expectations. The rate action so far is still working its way into the economy. Hence, the MPC decided to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that, as I have already stated, to ensure that inflation progressively aligns to the target while supporting growth. I would now like to provide an assessment of the growth and the inflation situation. First, let me focus on global growth in brief. The global economy continues to remain fragile. World trade is decelerating amidst global tide of protectionism. Despite significant restoration of global supply chains, factors like elevated debt levels, lingering geopolitical hostilities, and extreme weather conditions aggravate the risks to global growth and inflation outlook. Easing of inflation in advanced economies has led to expectations of an early end to the monetary policy tightening cycle, shoring up market sentiments. Sovereign bond yields are softening as markets are not factoring in any further rate hikes. Coming to domestic growth, economic activity in India exhibited buoyancy in the second quarter of this year, aided by strong domestic demand. GDP growth, as you would know, posted a robust growth of 7.6% in the second quarter of this year, that is 2023-24, driven largely by investment and government consumption. Turning to the third quarter, two-third of rubi sowing has been completed despite late harvest of kharif crops in some states. Manufacturing sector gained strength with easing input cost pressures and pickup in demand conditions. Eight core industries recorded healthy growth in October and continued their high growth since June this year. The Purchasing Managers Index, that is the PMI for manufacturing, rose in November. The services sector buoyancy has remained intact as reflected in the high, high frequency indicators which the Reserve Bank monitors. GST collections at rupees 1.68 lakh crore in November 2023 were also buoyant. Services PMI displayed healthy expansion in November. In my statement, I, there is a lot of data available which I have put in the footnote. So those of you who are uh, interested can have a look at the footnotes. The entire data in support of whatever I am saying is available in the footnotes. On the demand side, households consumption is supported by durable urban demand and gradual turnaround in rural demand as reflected in sales of fast-moving consumer goods, that is FMCG, and other indicators. Festival-related demand is also spurring household discretionary consumption in the third quarter, that is in the current quarter. Investment activity continues to be aided by buoyancy in public sector capex. This is also reflected in strong growth in steel consumption, cement production, and imports of capital goods. Capacity utilization in the manufacturing sector continues to remain above the long period average. Investments in fixed assets by listed private sector manufacturing companies also registered healthy growth in the first half of 23-24, primarily driven by key industries such as petroleum, steel, chemicals and cement. The total flow of resources to the commercial sector from banks and other sources at rupees 17.6 lakh crore during the current financial year so far is significantly higher than that of last year, which was at rupees 14.5 lakh crore. 
despite weaknesses in external demand, both goods and services exports returned to positive territory during the month of October, in October this year. Looking ahead, private consumption should gain support from gradual improvement in rural demand, strengthening of manufacturing activity, and continued buoyancy in services. The healthy twin balance sheets of banks and corporates, high capacity utilization, continuing business optimism, and government's thrust on infrastructure spending should propel private sector capex. The drag from external demand is also expected to moderate with a turnaround in merchandise and services exports. The protracted geopolitical turmoil, volatility in global financial markets, and growing geoeconomic fragmentations, however, pose risks to the outlook. Now, taking all these factors into consideration, real GDP growth for the current year, that is 2023-24, is projected at 7%. I repeat, real GDP growth is projected at 7% for the current year, with the third quarter at 6.5% and the fourth quarter at 6%. Real GDP growth for next year, and we have provided the figures for the three quarter, first three quarters of next year. So real GDP growth for the first quarter of 24-25 is projected at 6.7%, for Q2 at 6.5%, and Q3 at 6.4%. The risks are evenly balanced. I would now like to turn to inflation. Food inflation, which was in double digits in July, has since then moderated to 6.2% in October, with correction in vegetable prices. Fuel inflation slipped into deflation since September, primarily, primarily reflecting the sharp fall in LPG prices in end August. The disinflation in core gathered momentum during September-October and reached levels last seen in the fourth quarter of 2019-20 due to the combined effect of policy rate increases and reduction in cost post pressures across core goods and services. Going ahead, inflation outlook would be considerably influenced by uncertain food prices. High frequency fruit food price indicators point to an increase in prices of key vegetables, which may push CPI inflation higher in the near term. The ongoing rubby sowing progress for key crops like wheat, spices and pulses needs to be closely monitored. Elevated global sugar prices is also a matter of concern. On the positive side, global commodity prices, particularly agricultural commodities, have softened except rice. For highly import, depend, for highly import dependent food items like edible oils, international prices continue to remain soft. Domestic milk prices have stabilized. Proactive supply-side interventions by the government are also containing domestic food price pressures. Crude oil has softened considerably, though it may remain volatile. Taking into account these factors and on the assumption of normal monsoons, CPI inflation is projected at 5.4 percent for the current year, that is 2023-24 with the third quarter at 5.6% and the fourth quarter at 5.2%. CPI inflation, and here again we are giving for the first three quarters of next year, CPI inflation for the Q1 24-25 is projected at 5.2%, Q2 at 4%, and Q3 at 4.7%. The risks are evenly balanced. <clears throat> Now, what do these inflation and growth conditions mean for monetary policy? Let me provide our assessment. We have made significant progress in bringing down inflation to below 5% in October 2023, despite occasional blips due to intermittent supply shocks. The summer of 2022 is behind us. 
our policy of prioritizing inflation over growth, hiking the interest rates that is policy rate by 250 basis points in a calibrated manner and draining out excess liquidity have worked well alongside supply side measures taken by the government to bring about this disinflation. The fact that core inflation has also tended, has also trended lower and household inflation expectations have become better anchored gives us the confidence and conviction that monetary policy is doing its job. On the other hand, growth remains resilient and robust, surprising everyone on the upside. Notwithstanding this progress, the target of 4% CPI is yet to be reached and we have to stay the course. Headline inflation continues to be volatile due to multiple supply side shocks which have become more frequent and intense. The trajectory of food inflation needs to be closely monitored. Intermittent vegetable price shocks could once again push, push up the headline inflation in November and as I said possibly December. While monetary policy would look through such one-off shocks, monetary policy has to stay alert to the risk of such shocks becoming generalized and derailing the ongoing disinflation process. In the midst of these uncertainties, monetary policy has to remain actively disinflationary to ensure a durable alignment of headline inflation to the target rate of 4% while supporting growth. I would now like to focus on the liquidity and financial market conditions. Like most other central banks, the Reserve Bank had injected additional liquidity into the system to counter the COVID-related onslaught on our economy. Consequently, the size of the Reserve Bank's balance sheet had expanded significantly. Persistence of such expanded balance sheet far too long could have created macroeconomic and financial instability. It is worth noting that the Reserve Bank has successfully reduced its balance sheet size well in time. Illustratively, the size of Reserve Bank's balance sheet swelled to 28.6% of GDP in 2020-21. With modulation in liquidity in the post-COVID period, the balance sheet size moderated to 23.3% of GDP in 2022-23 and further to 21.6% in the current financial year up to December 1. We consider this as a significant achievement. System liquidity as measured by net position under the liquidity adjustment facility that is LAF turned into deficit mode for the first time in September this year, after a gap of nearly four and a half years since May 2019. Deficit liquidity conditions persisted during October and November, prompting large recourse to marginal standing facility, that is MSF, by the banks. In parallel, utilization of standing deposit facility, that is SDF, has also been high. The overall tightening of liquidity conditions is attributed mainly to higher currency leakage during the festive season, government cash balances, and reserve banks' market operations. Driven by these autonomous factors, system liquidity tightened significantly compared to what was envisaged in the October policy statement. Consequently, the need to undertake auction of OMO sales has not arisen so far. The evolution of liquidity conditions has been in alignment with the monetary policy stance. More recently, however, as government spending has picked up and system liquidity has got more evenly balanced among market participants, pressures have eased and the, laugh, and the net laugh position has evened out broadly. Going forward, government spending is likely to further ease liquidity conditions. On our part, the Reserve Bank will remain nimble in liquidity management. Now, different segments of the financial markets have witnessed monetary transmission of varying extent. Long-term GSEC yields have softened, 
reflecting strong demand for these bonds from financial institutions and softening of global bond yields. In the credit market, monetary policy transmission is still working its way through the system and the supporting data is provided in the footnote. With regard to standing facilities of the Reserve Bank under the LAF, we have noticed, as I pointed out, we have noticed simultaneous high utilization of both MSF and SDF by the banks. This was also pointed out by me in the last monetary policy statement. We propose to address this situation and have therefore decided to allow reversal of liquidity facilities under both SDF and MSF even during weekends and holidays with effect from December 30, 2023. This is an important announcement so far as the banks and the liquidity situation is concerned. So let me just uh, read it again. Uh, we have decided to allow reversal of liquidity facilities under both SDF and MSF even during weekends and holidays with effect from December 30 this year, that is December 30, 2023. It is expected that this measure will facilitate better fund management by the banks. This measure will be reviewed after six months or earlier if needed. The Indian rupee has exhibited low volatility compared to its EME peers in the calendar year 2023 despite elevated U.S. Treasury yields and a stronger U.S. dollar. The relative stability of the Indian rupee reflects the improving macroeconomic fundamentals of the Indian economy and its resilience in the face of formidable global tsunamis. Recently, the Reserve Bank and the Bank of England have signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Cooperation and Exchange of Information relating to the Clearing Corporation of India, which is a central counterparty that is regulated and supervised by the Reserve Bank. The MOU will enable the Bank of England to assess CCIL for recognition as a third country CCP, that is central counterparty, for UK-based banks to clear their transactions through CCIL. This MOU is based on the principles of mutual cooperation and trust among the regulators of both the countries, that is India and England. We hope the regulators of other jurisdictions also accept these principles. Financial stability, I would now like to just focus briefly on the aspect of financial stability. Financial stability, as we have stated before, is a public good. The Reserve Bank judiciously uses micro and macro prudential tools to safeguard financial stability. The recent preemptive measures taken by the Reserve Bank in respect, of ba in respect of banks and NBFCs were geared towards addressing potential risks and preserving the resilience of the financial sector. We do not wait for the house to catch fire and then act. Prudence at all times should be the guiding principle, should be the guiding philosophy, both for the regulators as well as the regulated entities. I now propose to turn to the external sector. In October this year, both merchandise exports and imports came back to the expansionary zone. Services exports remained buoyant during the second quarter of this year. India has remained the top remittance receiving country. The net balance under services and remittances is expected to partly offset India's current account deficit and keep it within the parameters of viability. On the financing side, foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI flows, have, significant, have seen a significant turnaround during the current year, with net FPI inflows of US dollar 24.9 billion up to December 6, as against net outflows in the preceding two years. Net foreign direct investment, that is FDI, on the other hand, moderated to US dollar 10.4 billion in April, October this year from US dollar 20.8 billion a year ago. 
net inflows under external commercial borrowings that is ECBs and non-resident deposit accounts are however much higher than last year. India's external vulnerability indicators exhibit higher resilience in comparison with EME peers as well as since the taper tantrum period. India's foreign exchange reserves stood at 604 billion US dollars as on 1st December 2023. We remain confident of meeting our external financial requirements comfortably. I would now like to announce certain additional measures. First one relates to review of regulatory framework for hedging of foreign exchange risks. The regulatory framework for foreign exchange derivative transactions was last reviewed in 2020. Based on market developments and feedback received from market participants, the extant regulatory framework for forex derivative transactions has been refined and consolidated under a single master direction. This will further deepen the forex derivatives market by enhancing operational efficiency and ease of access for the users. The next announcement relates to framework for connected lending. The extent guidelines on connected lending are limited in scope. It has been decided to come out with a unified regulatory framework on, collect, on connected lending for all regulated entities of the Reserve Bank. This will further strengthen the pricing and management of credit by the regulated entities. The next announcement relates to regulatory framework for web aggregation of loan products. The Reserve Bank had introduced the regulatory framework for digital lending in August-September 2022. The digital lending ecosystem also comprises of services that aggregate loan offers from various lenders and this is called web aggregation of loan products. Now, this is meant for the guidance of the customers. It enables the customers to decide which loan product to opt for. Several concerns relating to such web, ag such web aggregation of loan products which harm consumers' interest have come to our notice. It has therefore been decided to lay down a regulatory framework for web aggregation of loan products. This is expected to result in enhanced customer centricity and transparency in digital lending. Next announcement relates to setting up of a fintech deposit repository. I'm sorry, a fintech repository. Financial entities like banks and NBFCs in India are increasingly partnering with fintechs. For better understanding of developments in the fintech ecosystem and to support this sector, it is proposed to set up a fintech repository. This facility, this repository will be operationalized by the Reserve Bank Innovation Hub in April 2024 or earlier. Fintechs would be encouraged to provide relevant information voluntarily to this repository. The next announcement, there are two announcements relating to UPI. The first one of them, the first announcement relating to UPI is uh, for enhancing the UPI transaction limit for specified categories. The limit for various categories of UPI transactions have been reviewed from time to time. It is now proposed to enhance the UPI transaction limit for payment to hospitals and educational institutions from rupees 1 lakh to rupees 5 lakh per transaction. This will help the consumers to make UPI payments of higher amounts for education and healthcare facilities for education and healthcare purposes. The second announcement relating to UPI relates to, you know, again, uh, it relates to e-mandates for recurring online transactions. It's actually, I mean, it's, it's a much broader announcement. Uh, it relates to e-mandates for recurring online transactions and specifically it uh, focuses on enhancement of limit for specified categories. E-mandates for making of recurring uh, e-mandates for making payments of recurring nature have become popular among customers. Under this framework, 
An additional factor authentication is currently required for recurring transactions exceeding rupees 15,000. It is now proposed to enhance this limit to 1 lakh rupees per transaction for recurring payments for mutual fund subscriptions, insurance premium subscriptions, and credit card repayments. This measure will further accelerate the uses of e-mandates. So, strictly speaking, this is not a part of UPI alone. I mean, it's a wider, uh, you know, it has got wider ramifications. And uh, the final, the last announcement that I have, uh, it relates to establishment of a cloud facility for the financial sector in India. Banks and financial institutions are maintaining an ever-increasing volume of data. Many of them are utilizing the cloud facilities for this purpose. The Reserve Bank is working on establishing a cloud facility for the financial sector in India for this purpose. Such facility would enhance data security, integrity and privacy. It would also facilitate better scalability and business continuity. The cloud facility is intended to be rolled out in a calibrated fashion over the medium term. Uh, I would now like to conclude. In a global economy clouded by uncertainties, monetary policy actions and communication can be a stabilizing force by anchoring the expectations of economic agents. Clarity and consistency in action and communication is a time-tested principle for effective monetary policy. Policymakers have to be mindful of the risk of being carried away by a few months of good data or by the fact that CPI inflation has come within the target range. They have to be also mindful of the risk of over-tightening, especially when large structural changes geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts are taking place. On top of this, they have to be watchful of the risks from new shocks that could hit the economy from anywhere, anytime. We have now reached a stage when every action has to be thought through even more carefully to ensure overall macroeconomic and financial stability, more so because the conditions ahead could be fickle. We have to remain vigilant and ready to act as per the evolving outlook. India is better placed to withstand the uncertainties compared to many other countries. As the Indian economy trades to the path, trades the path, let me repeat, as the Indian economy trades the path to a brighter future, I recall the wise words of Mahatma Gandhi and I quote, progress is absolutely assured whenever there is an unalterable determination. Thank you. Namaskar.